this past February, a sheep that had been lost in the Australian countryside was finally found after apparently a long time of being on his own. His wool had grown so long, so thick, so matted that he could barely walk and could hardly see and was unable to eat. This sheep was taken to a rescue sanctuary where he was immediately shorn of 77 pounds of wool. <clears throat> the rescuers named this sheep Barak. <laughs> And the photos of him are both comical and pitiful, really. I sent those photos out, by the way, in the email this morning, and I'll send them again in the e-news this week so you can see Barak. Now, we might imagine two different kinds of responses to an image of an overgrown sheep like Barak. We might, on the one hand, think, wow, a windfall of wool just Think of all the products we can make and sell from all this wool. And in fact, most media reports of this story actually led with that calculation. At least 61 sweaters and 490 pairs of socks. We might, on the other hand, imagine how uncomfortable and even painful all that wool likely is and then do whatever we can to provide some relief. Broadly speaking, we could refer to that first posture as commodification, right? Or treating other living <clears throat> beings as objects for our own use or our buying and selling. The second posture is rooted in something like empathy, or treating other living beings not as objects but as subjects with dignity and compassion. Of course, these two kinds of responses are not, not neatly separated from each other. They're very complexified, <laughs> they intertwine with each other. But here's the problem. For the last three centuries, at least in Western society, we have been treating Earth increasingly as one big storehouse of commodities. The trees, the bees, the water, the fish, the air, the birds, the oil, gas, gold, silver, platinum, titanium, palladium, if you haven't heard of palladium. It's one of the precious metals that makes these electronic devices that we use actually run. And they are rare. By treating Earth as a warehouse of stuff rather than a complex system of living networks and ecosystems, we have unleashed a process of climate change that now poses a threat to the vitality of every single ecosystem on the planet. And John Fullenweider, who read this morning, actually has some ideas about how we might counter climate change, if you saw his... Uh, uh, opinion piece in the Holland Sentinel, you know about that. We have also, and I, so, I'm so sorry to have to say this, we have multiplied the natural process of extinction on this planet by a factor of 10. That means that there are hundreds, hundreds of species going extinct every single day, day. Now, most of us have heard of these environmental crises before, maybe even many times, but what I keep returning to is something that we don't talk about nearly as much, if at all, and I mean that our sense of separation from 
God's creation or more f- severely feeling alienated and alone in the world because of how we have reduced everything to objects and things. I'm describing a deep wound that all of us carry and few of us know how to name. That woundedness is expressed in many ways and we see this in the daily news every day from addictions and resentments and isolation and hatred and violence in this deeply fragmented world, I really want to use the word celebration for Earth Day, but that's not the word that's coming to mind. (laughs) We need healing. Healing. Deep and sustained healing. What does any of this have to do with Easter? on a chilly April morning here in Saugatuck. I'll just briefly say, John gives us an answer to that question this morning in his account of the gospel, and it harkens back to Barak the sheep. (laughs) For John, what all of this has to do with Easter is the figure of the good shepherd. What makes a shepherd good rather than bad? John's answer is this. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says, and I lay down my life for the sheep. A hired hand doesn't do this, Jesus says. The hired hand doesn't know the sheep like I do. The hired hand doesn't know each sheep by name, cannot call them home with just a tone of voice, will not protect them from the prowling wolf. A shepherd is good, in other words, only because of love. And the first letter of John, from which we also heard this morning, thank you, Cindy, for reading that, confirms this. This is how we know love, John says, that Jesus laid down his life for us. And then, John says more pointedly, so we should lay down our lives for each other because of love. We must learn how to love again. Love for healing. And we have to do this with everything we've got. That's why we're here on a chilly April morning (laughs) in Saugatuck. It's why we're live streaming. It's why we come to this table to be fed by love, to be healed by God's love, and then to be sent out as agents of God's healing love in the world. That's what we're doing. Barak the sheep encountered just a little morsel of that love, of the good shepherd who sheared him, (laughs) who freed him of that weight he had been carrying from his exile. Barak experienced that love in being welcomed back to the herd, of being welcomed back home 
of knowing if just for a moment that he was not alone in the world. Barak the sheep. Us the sheep. As we gather here on this fourth Sunday of Easter and mark Earth Day, may we find our hope renewed in the never-failing love of God that is stronger than our sorrow, stronger than our wounds, stronger than even death. Amen.